Welcome back. Today we are going to talk about how to use factor models to come up with very meaningful estimates for covariance matrix parameters. Remember that we are facing the curse of dimensionality and we need to reduce the number of parameters. It turns out that using a factor model is, is a very reasonable way to do this. So, you know, here is a typical kind of factor model decomposition of asset returns. We are trying to explain asset returns in terms of the, the, the asset exposure with respect to underlying risk factors. And we are going to assume in this case that we have n assets, let's say 100 stocks, and we have a smaller number of factors, say uh, we call it k, the number of factors, and k could be you know, something like 3, 4, 5, I mean some reasonable parsimonious uh, factor model that, that we're going to be using. Now, we can use the factor model doing some straightforward kind of, you know, mathematical development. We can use the factor model to get an expression for the variance and the covariance of stock returns based on the factor models. So, for example, what we find is the variance in the given stock, it can be obtained as a function of the beta of the stock with respect to the factors, and also as a function of the variance of the factors. Again, we also involving in general the covariance uh, between the factors, but you know, very often uh, we are trying to do our best to look at and to use uncorrelated uh, factor returns to the covariance, but actually that covariance term might actually be zero, as we will see in a moment. We can do exactly the same for covariance parameters. And you know, the mathematical expressions will tell you again that what we need to uh, have is estimate for the betas of the stocks and the variance of the factors. And if you have the betas of the stocks and the variance of the factors, then we can get a you know, good estimate for the covariance term. Now, if you're looking at the expression carefully, you also see that you have to deal in that expression with the covariance between the specific returns on the stocks, whatever fraction of stock return that's not explained by the factor model. That specific return is denoted by, you know, um, epsilon i and epsilon j for stock i and j. So we also need a covariance between these two terms. And here is the point that's very important here. Here is the point where we are going to start introducing some structure. We are going to make an assumption. We are going to make the assumption that specific risk on those two uh, stocks are uncorrelated. So we are going to cancel out that term. We are going to say that term should be zero. Now, in reality, if you try on a given sample, the data would tell you that that term may not be zero. Well, the problem is if you have to estimate, you know, uh, covariance between specific returns on many pairs of stocks, then you're back to square one. You're not reducing the curse of dimensionality. So the key assumption here, and that's where we're introducing some kind of model risk, we're assuming away this kind of correlation between specific returns. Now, when you think about it, if your factor model does a good job at capturing the commonalities in stock returns, then by definition of what we mean capturing the commonalities, whatever remains is actually specific to stock I and stock J. So if your factor model is well specified, you know, assuming that the specific components are uncorrelated is not too bad of an assumption. It's not too much of an assumption because you know, everything else, everything that they have in common has already been taken care of by the, by the factor model. Now, that was the two-factor case. You can you know, have a general decomposition in the uh, k-factor case. And again, if you're assuming uncorrelated uh, factors, what you find as a conclusion is, if you start with 100 stocks, for example, you need to, and, and say, you know, say five factors, then you need to estimate betas for each stock with respect to each factor. So that's 100 betas with respect to each factor, so that's 500 betas. So what's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion is to estimate the covariance parameters. You only need now 500 parameter estimates, betas of 100 stocks with respect to five factors. It may sound a lot, but remember that if you don't do something like this, you'd have to estimate 5,000 parameters. So in other words, we have reduced the, the, the curse of dimensionality by a factor of 10, 
and we've done so in a fairly meaningful way. So the next question that remains is what kind of factor models we are going to be using to do so. Um, well, you can use the simplest factor model, uh, the, 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 you know, the one that's kind of the most you know, basic one, which is a single factor model. Well, what you're doing is you're regressing the return, say, on individual stocks, for example, on the return on the market. And you get a single beta in this case. So that's something that you can do. Of course, if you do so, uh, you will be concerned that, you know, assuming away correlation between specific returns will come uh, with a big uh, cost in terms of, you know, simplifying assumption because we know that there's more than one common factors impacting asset returns. There are typically multiple factors, common factors impacting asset returns. So, you know, it's probably better to be using some kind of a factor model, multi-factor model. There are three families of multi-factor models. Uh, the first one is the so-called uh, explicit uh, macro uh, factor model. So, well, you could be using something like, you know, inflation, growth, uh, some kind of, you know, interest rates, term spread. So you're using kind of macro variables. So we call them macro factor models. You could also be using micro factor models. In other words, you could be looking at attributes actually or characteristics of different stocks and thinking of these characteristics as a way to try and explain differences in, in risk uh, parameters. These characteristics could be something like country, industry, size, book to market, I mean the typical um, attributes that, 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 you know, people can, you know, can be using and have a meaningful influence on stock returns. And finally, you could be using an implicit factor model where you're not even imposing your view on what the factors should be and you're leading the data through some kind of statistical analysis like some kind of principal component analysis, the data is going to tell you what the factors are. And typically, you're going to constrain the statistical analysis to generate orthogonal, uncorrelated factors, which, which as we said, was helpful for parameter estimates. Well, let me uh, say that you actually have professional provider of risk models that will give you, in, in the form of a, of a dedicated software, give you access to all of these kind of fancy ways of estimating uh, you know, covariance parameters you know, through a given factor model. And, you know, most sophisticated asset managers, that's exactly what they use. They use some of these, uh, you know, some of these techniques and models. Okay, in terms of wrapping up, well, using a factor model turns out to be a fairly convenient way to reduce the number of parameters because you're not doing it in, in, in a completely ad hoc manner. You're only assuming that whatever is not explained by the factor model is kind of very specific to each stock and therefore uncorrelated stock by stock. That's the only assumption you're making. So as long as your factor model uh, has done a good job at capturing the commonalities in, in, fact, in, in, in security returns, then you know, you're going to be okay. You're going to get a pretty good estimate for uh, your parameters. Now, in practice, uh, there's a tendency to believe that you know, using an implicit factor model can be, use, can be giving you kind of the best trade-off uh, if only because you're not imposing any structure or any explicit view on what the factor should be. You let the data tell you. And, you know, as long as this is implemented in a robust way, um, hopefully uh, this will allow you to uh, address the curse of dimensionality uh, fairly efficiently.